So for chapter two of new rules, uh, we are talking a little bit about the new rules that uh, Scott was talking about throughout the course of his uh, book here. And I, I really like this chapter a lot, uh, especially because we're starting to get into some of the new ideas of what we should think about for cost-effective marketing and PR. Um, and so as a general rule, and this was something that I always found really interesting was the, uh, this is actually a premise that a, a PR representative told me one time that I really enjoyed is uh, as a general rule in PR, as a general rule of marketing, is a general rule of life, is that you have to control the narrative. So this is uh, Scott's, one of Scott's first main points is controlling the narrative. And every company, every organization, uh, every advertisement is part of a narrative. And so you explain a lot about your company, you explain a lot about your story, you explain about a lot of the things you're doing, and that encapsulate what makes you, you, and your identity. And so again, if you are the one posting content um, specifically as well as frequently, um, you get to control that narrative in terms of how people think about you. Um, and it's interesting because there's a really um, cool article by a actual uh, North Dakota State graduate um, like myself. Uh, her name's at Sh her name's Sherry Vale. She's at the University of Kentucky and she does a lot with crisis communication. And one of the things she mentions with PR is always being in contact with your journalists. So um, her emphasis deals mostly with crisis communication. And so she mentions, so you don't get caught in this crisis area. The best thing to do is keep in constant contact with your journalists. Um, to make sure that they have uh, a better understanding with what's going on. And again, controlling the narrative. And so it's always better to disclose potential crisis information uh, before the journalists say that, the, say that themselves. Uh, because there are things such as uh, media framing, for instance, uh, which is a very popular media theory uh, in the field of mass communication. And because of that, you know, the a media organization only has so much time to cover something and they may miss some facts. They may say something that you didn't want them to as an organization. And again, this deals a lot with crisis, but it also has to deal with marketing and your company's reputation as well. Um, and, and when I say the marketing pre premise, think of like TripAdvisor. So I don't know if any of y'all have gone on vacation recently um, or been to a hotel uh, within your area and you went to TripAdvisor and said what is the rating? What are people saying about this particular hotel? And this is important because if they're the ones coming in and saying this hotel is awful, I had a really bad time and you're seeing consistent results like that and you're not contributing to that narrative, you're not contributing to the internet space, uh, that's the story that's going to be told. So if you are a business that's a two out of five and you have nothing to combat that two out of five, you are a two out of five, which is really harsh. However, that's the narrative that's being spoken about you right now. So again, being able to promote this information um, effectively uh, can raise your ratings into that. Uh, for example, Delta does a pretty good job. Uh, in terms of their Twitter, regardless of how many follows, followers you have, if you go on there and say, hey, Delta screwed up my flight, or I missed something, or I'm delayed, uh, I've posted on Twitter several times, and what did they do? They posted right back and said, uh, let's talk. And they gave, uh, gave me a number um, to say, this is your reference number, and uh, more times than not, they, they covered something. Um, but again, I don't have any followers, but it's the mere fact of, Keeping themselves in their own discussion is very important. So, um, the next thing that David Merriman Scott po points out, and this is kind of part two, is about the internet is the greatest technological revolution uh, when it comes to communication. And there are a lot of them. So, um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, communication revolutions. Um, and if you're looking at a gentleman by the name of Marshall McLuhan, who is a major uh, name in the field of mass communication. There are four um, revolutions. Uh, first is tribal, uh, which is storytelling. 
So um, a, a, a person would go from group to group and mention a story uh, to them. And, and, and this has gone on for a very long time. In fact, uh, the next one, which is called the uh, Literate uh, Epic, um, actually deals with, again, reading and writing and so forth. Um, there's always this uh, theory that ran around about Socrates and how he thought that writing information down was actually uh, not a good idea. And so it's really interesting how anytime a technical, or, or, excuse me, a, a communication revolution comes by, um, there's always this, uh, there's always this backlash with it. And I mean, we 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 see that with things like television, radio, um, you know, e even again the internet. So after tribal, again, people start to learn how to read, but more specifically, nobles learn how to read. So this is again the literate epic. Um, so they can, again, control the narrative in terms of what being said because they have the written history. Um, this goes all the way up until, and I'm skipping through this really quickly, this goes all the way up to um, the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther um, posted the 95 Thesis, as well as the Protestant Reformation that ensued, um, which also has to do with Johann Gutenberg's The Printing Press. So that's the third one, which is the printing epic. And again, this is an area where people are starting to uh, understand uh, and, and being able to read for themselves. So, the, you know, Protestant Reformation brought a lot of denominations within Christianity of how we can read the Bible and, you know, how we can interpret uh, some of the things within the Bible. And this is all going to become really important here in a second. I'm, I'm not just running on a tangent here. Um, but... It, it comes in this level of skepticism. And each time we move into a revolution, not only is there backlash for the previous one that was used, but also there is this level of skepticism um, in terms of how we're using it, in terms of what the narrative is. And so that's gonna be really important again here in a few minutes here. Uh, the last one, so again, we've got tribal, literate, printing, and then the last one is the electronic epic. And this one uh, is something that Marshall McLuhan said is it kind of actually brings everything back together to almost this tribal epic in that most people can give a message out to the world um, at any given point in time. And, and I say this that... Um, um, <laughs> losing my train of thought here... <laughs> uh, I was looking actually through a video of what do specific countries think of Americans. And again, this is free access of me to understand, um, you know, the perception of our culture. And again, this is worldwide um, and not just uh, specific tribes that are communicating with each other. This is, uh, again, what's called a global village. And again, now when... The, the electronic epoch was mentioned first. Um, one of the things that was mentioned was uh, that this had to do with things like radio and TV. Now we have uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication with each other. I mentioned this briefly in the first chapter. Is There's this interaction loop with the internet uh, that David Merriman Scott mentions that when we post something, it can automatically be seen by everyone um, that usually is subscribing or pays attention to, and thus can comment on it immediately. And so if you're messing things up, um, again, uh, it can be corrected quickly. Again, this is why, um, you know, anytime Donald Trump tweets something, uh, it's, it goes to the masses really quickly, and people comment, and comment on it really quickly, um, as well as make their own material, which can be actually a really good asset if it's done well, um, but it, it can also hurt you as well. So, within this new technological revolution of the electronic epic, um, and more specifically the internet, um, we want to mention how do we get noticed? And um, Scott mentioned something really cool in terms of, um, first and foremost, we look at the old rules, and the old rules said if you spend a lot of money, if you go through the biggest area of impressions and exposure with the most large amount of people um, during a good time span, that's when you're going to get your biggest consumer base. And again, that's not always 
um, or necessarily gone out of date. However, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about the Super Bowl last week, but I'm talking about another sporting event that I get really into, which is the Tour de France. And I don't know if anybody has watched the Tour de France, especially last summer. And if you don't know what that is, it's just a really big bike race uh, that spans a, a little bit into France and Spain. And sometimes there's another country that's involved there. But it's extremely popular and uh, some of the best riders in the world, uh, including a Lees McRae graduate, uh, Brent Brookwalter. Uh, was actually a cyclist for the uh, Tour de France a few years ago, which was cool because I actually shared a dorm with him. So I get into this, uh, and I'm really interested. In it. And, and I ask, you know, if you've watched it this, this summer, uh, you know, typically they have it on NBC Sports, uh, which was uh, used to be called Versus, uh, also used to be called the Outdoor Life Network. And again, in terms of exposure, it used to be that we would post the information that was on uh, the television, and that's about the only exposure you get. You get a few interviews and so forth. But again, are you going to be combating with something like baseball or the Olympics, if it's an Olympic year, or you know any kind of sport that's going on during that time? Um, the NHL might overlap or NBA. I, I don't remember if those overlap. Uh, but now... There's a lot of interactivity, which is really cool because, again, Tour de France outside of Europe isn't exactly really popular here. And so instead of, again, paying a lot of money for exposure, what you see now is that there are videos everywhere uh, on Twitter, for instance, uh, where bike, uh, cyclists will talk about what they were doing on their off day. And so they were really interesting in terms of talking about the equipment they were using. Uh, they showed pictures of uh, poor, poor, poor gentlemen who were riding this thing. They'd show pictures of their legs and how what the toll is uh, to ride in this event. It's so super interesting. And again, the social media storm was colossal. And because of this, and this is again what Scott was mentioning through uh, this particular section of how do we get noticed was bicycles um, was his main topic. And he mentioned about the experts. And again the specific area with the Tour de France is they would show again a bike that works really well for them and a brand that works really well for them and this does go a little bit into the research that I've conducted in terms of we've talked about these niche markets before what about the experts within them if they're using a specific product if they're telling you this is a product that you should use it's really cool it uh, works really well for the best possible production uh, and performance, then you should get it. And a lot of people do that. Or at the very least, they question it um, in terms of go into like an Amazon or something for review. Granted, you're not going to do that for the, at least I don't think, uh, for how much a road bike costs, which are extremely expensive. Um, and um, so they, they mention again these area of stating facts, don't st stick with flood. Uh, fluff, and it's mainly because our generation uh, of media users, and particularly the millennial generation, is one of the most skeptical media users uh, of any generation. And that's usually just because they've had more exposure to it. Um, so um, <laughs> I always give my students a hard time, um, particularly the ones that are in that 18, 21 year old demographic. Uh, within uh, the university here. But one thing that I always mention is that y'all are some of the biggest skeptics when it comes to any kind of information coming out, um, which is cool. But it makes it a little harder to navigate through that narrative once again because they're always challenging. And so what do we do? Um, what do we do if we're given a narrative and that's being challenged um, and one solution that Scott mentioned was the idea of forums. And so I don't know if you've ever been on a forum before or spent a lot of activity on forums. I like forums, uh, specifically in terms of information that I can't necessarily get from a hotel or a um, just any kind of information I want. So for example, um, I wanted to know how to get a parking space 
for an Appalachian State football game uh, without a Yosef Club pass. So I could go on the Ab State website and look through the information there in terms of where I can park. And there's not a whole lot of information on the narrative. However, I can go on forums that have a lot of user responses in terms of where they've been, what their experience was, was like, um, and that way I can get a little bit better sense. Because again, uh, we may see uh, you know 100 hotels in the uh, in Chicago or New York City area, um, but if we go on a forum, we might say um, there's a couple people with user information of their experiences that may not be listed on the website. So that can give people a leg up. And so these forums are really cool and they're open to customers. So again, this bike brand that was mentioned in Scott's book was they can talk about anything. Um, and I often do this for uh, ski swaps. So I'll look at information about skis that are being sold, uh, what type of skis I, sh I should be using, uh, because we can't always be in those groups. So when I was here in Boone and Banner Elk, that's a common topic to talk about. However, when I was in Fargo, North Dakota or Raleigh, North Carolina, you know, we got to find those niche groups. However, if I'm online um, and looking through those forums, uh, it can make a big difference. And, you know, good places for some of that stuff is like Reddit, for instance. Reddit is a cool social media site um, that has, has stemmed a lot of uh, uh, good information for me to post on my Facebook uh, in terms of, I don't, I don't see too many businesses taking advantage of Reddit, but again, it's good for this word of mouth through people talking about different things um, and reviewing different things. Um, this is actually how I got some information about, uh, I like watching the show Game of Thrones, for instance. And, and through Game of Thrones, there was a subreddit that spoiled the entire season. Um, and that didn't bother me. I know some people are like, don't spoil anything when it comes to a television show, but it didn't really bother me so much. And so I got a big kick out of it when I was reading through it. Uh, but again, this is all user uh, promoted information uh, and it makes for really good business. And so in this case, it can be really good for business, uh, but in others, it might be pretty bad for business, especially if you're not paying attention to it. So I know a, uh, a few of you have mentioned, uh, Dr. Daniel, I'm in a small town. Uh, we don't use a whole lot of social media, um, which is actually can work to your advantage because you have that ability to control the, the narrative that much more. However, the bad thing is it's not visible. So if there's word of mouth going on, you know, you can go on a Google site and you can see a, uh, a star rating. So that's really important for, again, visualizing uh, what is being said about your company. And sometimes it's just about the responses that you make that can actually uh, bring your company up a notch is just responding. So in many cases, social media is such a necessity mainly because, again, of that narrative. And you get to... Uh, say what it is that you want to say instead of, again, a hundred people that don't like your, your product. Um, and again, if you're responding to each one of those and trying to resolve information uh, or revol resolve the information that's being sent out, uh, it can play very well in your favor. So um, that's just one area. And that's one of those ways we get noticed is, again, uh, working with that conversation with others. And that can be hard and time consuming, um, but it is important. Uh, and, and again, we, we start talking about this niche marketing, and this brings me into the fourth point of today, uh, is this idea of long tail marketing. So um, I don't know if you've ever looked up what long tail marketing is. Um, and basically, it just looks like a downward hill. So it starts at a, you know, I'm going to make sure I've got it off right. It starts on a ridge and then dips down. And you know what? I'm going to get a pen real quick and show you on the board. Don't mind my uh, little things I need to research here.
So that's more or less of what it looks like. Again, we've got this tall kind of tower here that mentions specifically about um, your mainstream marketing. So think of anything that would be considered mainstream uh, in terms of companies, in terms of music. Uh, those things are going to be important. Those things are going to be talking about. There was a reason why when Ellen DeGeneres uh, posted a selfie at the Oscars that it broke Twitter, uh, which is extremely hard to do. If it's popular, it, you know, like I said, it still has that balance. However, there is a whole section, make sure I got my finger here, play the meteorologist for a minute here, down here, there's a niche market. And again, there's not a whole lot of people that pay attention to it, but it is a major component of it still. So, and those people who are invested in it are really invested with it. So if you've paid attention in a, uh, if you've had a persuasion class before, um, you might have gone over something like social judgment theory, which means that you're really firm in this particular stance given a, a specific topic. And so again, sure, there is reason for mainstreaming and we need mainstreaming uh, because uh, they, it, again, it, it's what drives conversation. And, you know, Game of Thrones, I mentioned this again, is an extremely popular show uh, and that it's fallen into the mainstream. However, there's a bunch of other smaller shows uh, that are just as important and still need the attention there. So, um, let's see. Oh, but the thing is... When it comes to purchasing something, and I'm sorry, I kind of stopped there for a second, is that we've changed things when it comes to the things we watch and purchase uh, in terms of exactly what we want. So, for example, um, I would go to the, the mall, the Boone Mall, or um, any of the malls around this particular area, and I like to go to like sports apparel stores. Um, but I've got very specific tastes in what I like to buy. And so is it exactly the jersey that I wanted to buy? And most times out of not, it's no. I, I need to go on eBay. I need to go on Amazon. I need to go somewhere else. Um, and again, it's, is this exactly what you wanted to hear? Is this exactly what you wanted to buy? And this is why uh, companies like Amazon, Netflix, iTunes, have kicked their counterparts to the curb. Um, if you live in Boone um, and lived in Boone for a while, uh, you might remember that there used to be a blockbuster here um, and that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, because again, Netflix makes it so much easier uh, to select and preview and uh, get uh, ratings based on those. So you don't have to make an ill-advised purchase and you know, it's a monthly fee. Uh, as well as, I'm right by the building of um, where the ale house is now here in Boom. Uh, Fat Cats used to be there. And I used to love their going there as an undergraduate for CDs. Um, however, I've made a few ill-advised purchases when it comes to buying a CD um, that I would say, I like this one song or I like these two songs, but the rest of the CD was not very good. What does iTunes do? Um, you can preview those songs and see which ones you like and uh, or you can go on YouTube and preview those and then purchase the ones that you like instead of uh, you know honing through um, you know a bunch of material that you're not very fond of um, now that comes with its disadvantages um, but again that goes with that long tail marketing of would it be exactly the song or the CD I would want and so this is really important to consider with the type of marketing uh, in terms of dealing specifically with what consumers want at that particular given time. And so, and, and we search for products and we search for songs. That's our uses and gratifications again. I know I've mentioned this before. Um, it's what you want on this very second. And interestingly enough, uh, some places take advantage of that when it comes to the uh, products that are being sold. So uh, take, for example, we're all part of the Appalachian State community. Look at the Appalachian State University bookstore in terms of the actual shop versus the online. And I've seen this happen with every single university bookstore is that uh, 
it's never as expansive in the online section than it is in store. There's almost always a much better selection and uh, more things to choose from when you're in the store itself. And they, again, they do that on purpose. And it's a very interesting facet of, again, why we might have something uh, to bring people in uh, to that particular store. Um, I've still got a couple of notes here, but uh, I'm going to stop that for today. Again, think of this in terms of controlling your narrative. I know so many of you have mentioned uh, about a small organization that you're a part of and that you work for. One thing I can recommend is what are people saying about it? Um, are there any reviews on Google? Are there any uh, responses on Facebook um, or Twitter or Instagram? Or I mean, some of y'all may not have an Instagram account or anything like that. Um, but how are people responding to it? What's the word of mouth online? Uh, because again, you can't necessarily control the word of mouth um, in person, but you can control it in the digital space. And sometimes that can be just as important. So I challenge you all to look at some of those organizations that you work for and say, what is my narrative? Uh, what are we saying about it? How active 